This is breaking news from WCCO. And good morning. It is 1134. I'm Jason DeRussia. We're breaking into programming now to hear from Governor Tim Walz with the latest on the last night and the aftermath of the death of George Floyd. Let's listen. I want to just say uh, how grateful I am, uh, how proud I am of, uh, of Minnesotans for the second night uh, we've had uh, We've had the security and uh, the order on our streets. Uh, it has been a, a very tough week, but to watch uh, how Saturday and Sunday played out. A thank you to our, our public service, uh, our, our public servants out there on, on many different fronts. Uh, National Guard, State Patrol, police departments, sheriff's departments, as well as those who are out there making sure we maintain utilities and, and everything else. Um, also, speaking of and watching yesterday, uh, the whole nature of why we do these things is to allow for that peaceful expression. We saw large, peaceful protests focusing on the systemic changes that get to the heart of why we're in this situation. And when I say we, Minneapolis-St. Paul, the state of Minnesota, nationally, and as we've seen over the last 24 hours, internationally, a society that does not put equity and inclusion at the center of it is certainly going to uh, eventually uh, come to the places where we're at. Uh, this is a moment of inflection. It's a moment of real change. It's a moment that those folks who are out there demanding this are, are not going to take a, a commission or a report. Um, they're going to want fundamental change. And, and that is what I think, uh, that's one of the exciting things in the midst of all this. You can feel a sense of optimism coming back. Um, I, I just want to say, you, you'll hear from some of the things and the updates where we're at. I don't want to paint a picture that this is over, but I do want to paint a picture that I think we as Minnesotans have regrounded ourselves in the values that we care about. It looks to me like there's a clear delineation between the folks who are rightfully pained and angered wanting to see change and expressing it in lawful ways and what we witnessed on several days earlier in the week, those that are bent on wanton destruction of the very communities that are most pained. I think as citizens, as, uh, as residents of Minnesota, we can continue to maintain that. And this gives us a space now for, for a time of unprecedented opportunity to address things that have been around in, in many cases decades or since the founding or prior to that. Uh, so in moving forward and in that light, I want to talk a little bit about the posture we're in, um, in terms of, uh, of law enforcement and on, on the streets. I signed an executive order in consultation and leadership with the mayors of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We will be extending the curfew for two days, but the times will change. It will go from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. And one of the reasons in this is, is, is Minnesotans have taken charge of this. The only way these things work is what we've seen the last two nights the vast majority of people abide by this. Those that not are able to, uh, to address this. I do want to mention something. Uh, some of you witnessed this on, on many of your stations and live TV. Um, there were protesters that, that stayed out past the curfew. I think in some cases because of the tragic uh, near miss with the truck, it disrupted some of their schedules. Some of them, I think, were very intent on going home and doing that because it was very clear. Uh, they were articulating very clearly a uh, peaceful right to demonstrate, but they also understood once they got out past that time, um, the interaction with the police that some of you witnessed, a, and it was, uh, it was gratifying, I think, to see how citizens approached it and how um, our law enforcement approached it. The very humanized way, the very orderly way, that people were processed and treated and some of the interactions between the two to understand each other um, was for me the way I think people expect to be expect this to happen. So um, that curfew will, will go in place. We'll also think about the strategic uh, levels of what we have. I will have uh, General Jensen will be speaking about a transition to um, our National Guard troops back to their homes and their jobs because that's what they are. They take time out of their jobs and many of them will be going back, some of them working as news reporters, some of them working as camera operators, some of them working as teachers. Uh, that will begin to, to happen and that will be done, as General Jensen will talk about, in a very uh, orderly and organized way. Our strategy we need to continue to keep in place. The, uh, the multi-agency command center that stood up will stay in place because we are managing communications. I think some of you now have witnessed um, 
the complexity of something like this. It doesn't look like the movies. You have to get everybody on the same frequencies. You have to have communications to move people. And when you see an operation move in unison like you've seen the last few days with no prior training together, uh, that's a testament to the leadership of all of these different agencies, and that is the MAC. They'll continue to operate until the time comes when we transition back out of that. I do think it is worth noting that this week there will be, uh, at least as we understand right now, a significant event with the, the funeral memorial of uh, of George Floyd I believe is scheduled for Thursday it will be an important event both for the city of Minneapolis for Minnesota and for the nation um, to watch that process of celebrating a life that was taken in front of us an opportunity for leadership and when I say leadership what we're seeing now is where there are voids of leadership at certain levels you're certainly seeing leaders in communities that have always been there put their voices forward. So that will be uh, in conjunction of making sure, as we said yesterday, the idea of protecting peaceful protesters. And that brings me to yesterday, and you'll hear a little more detail on this, the incident with the, the truck that I, I think will live for many of us forever. I was watching that on the, the MnDOT cameras in the State Emergency Operations Center in live time when it happened, and uh, I, I was breathless as I watched it because I thought I was going to witness dozens or hundreds killed in the immediate crash and then my fear was the intentional thought of detonating that um, that truck as it turned out and I, I don't want to speak ahead of this but the preliminary with the interviews of the driver was frustrated they'll talk about how you close in sections and he got ahead of that and why they were exiting people and I'll let them talk about the details of that but from the driver's perspective he went around it saw the crowd went around the other cars. He did break is what you see. But I think the amazing thing in this story was, first of all, that no one was hurt. The crowd then responding, in, in many cases, just I'm sure adrenaline and fear and everything else was happening. But the driver noted afterwards, after he was told it didn't kill anybody, uh, he noted that the crowd, the vast majority, were protecting him. The protesters were protecting the driver who they had just seen appear to run into the crowd because they realized how dangerous the situation was. And for those of you who are old enough to remember that horrific scene on that Los Angeles road during the Rodney King events where the driver was pulled from the vehicle and severely injured, um, peaceful protesters in Minneapolis and St. Paul protected this person even after what we saw was appeared at the time to be an attempt to kill them. Um, I think that speaks volumes again, and I'm just I'm grateful to be able to tell that because I, I still am in shock of what I thought we might have to be talking about. I will note that that event did uh, have some disruptive uh, impact on movement of folks last night, but it still worked out, uh, I, I think, uh, again, an amazing thing of no deaths, no injuries, and last night, report of one fire that is still under investigation so can't be confirmed it was by this and it was immediately extinguished so um, we've got an opportunity here we've changed the direction of where this has gone we've opened up incredibly important conversations I uh, yesterday we saw Attorney General Ellison assume the lead in uh, in the case to start with um, many more things that need to be done at this point in time but but Minnesota uh, this is our chance and I would I would say this um, with that curfew it's June 1st we're still in the middle of a pandemic we are working simultaneously with this I'll give you a little bit of an update at the end uh, where we will talk about the number of tests we're doing are still very up we tested 22 long-term care facilities uh, we are planning for massive mobile testing in the cities for folks. I would tell those of you who are out there peacefully protesting, again, if you're starting to get symptoms of COVID-19, please isolate. Um, we will have to do some contact tracing, which I, I have not wrapped my mind around what that would look like in this size. Um, but we want to massively test you. We want to get you in and get the help. We want to get a handle on that. But June 1st, we're having restaurants open up outside. Um, it's going to be 85 degrees this afternoon. We've got restaurants uh, across the state that are ready to do that. Um, this is a time for community to gather outside, gather outside uh, in the early evening, uh, experience what Minnesota has to offer, and let's, let's have some of that happen. Let's get some of those things back going again. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Harrington, Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Governor. John Harrington, Department of Public Safety. Uh, we watched yesterday afternoon, as many of you did, uh, 
uh, two really uh, startling events. Uh, we watched uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon as between five and 7,000 people came to demonstrate uh, at U.S. Bank. We saw moms with their kids. We saw, uh, we saw elders from the community. We saw young people all coming together uh, in what was a, a very large uh, and a very peaceful uh, demonstration at U.S. Bank Stadium. Uh, we also saw that, that group um, move on to the freeway, uh, and then we saw what ha can only be described as that, that moment, well, I can't use that term in front of polite company, but of uh, when you saw the truck going into that crowd and you just winced because what you imagined you were going to see was bodies under the tires of that truck. Uh, and when you didn't see the bodies under the tires of the truck, um, it was, frankly, possibly a miracle. Um, because the driver was doing 70 miles an hour, as we understand it, or in that range. Uh, and even with hitting the brakes uh, and even with dry pavement, uh, we, were, we got lucky. Uh, or there was something miraculous happening there. Uh, once that happened, we uh, continued our operational posture in terms of our working through the curfew and working through our protest uh, prevention, uh, our riot prevention model. Uh, uh, the rapid response team moved, uh, and you could literally see it in real time. You could see the rapid response team, bikes and cars and trucks moving in to the protest area, around the truck, making sure that we could control uh, what we thought might turn into another really bad situation. Uh, and the peace officers that responded to that responded uh, with restraint, and they responded with care, and they were able to contain this situation in such a way that we really did feel like we had some control over it. It took hours to continue to move that along. Uh, and at the end of the night, uh, we really did feel like the interaction uh, was uh, right at the right tone. We were having moms with their kids leave uh, because they really uh, were, that was early on in this, that we're not curfew. It was, a, there was an opportunity for us to sort this out. Um, we had folks that didn't want to leave and who were clearly there by design. Uh, and we made, I think, good decisions throughout. Uh, today, we started the morning out, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, looking at the intel, looking uh, for additional information, looking for signs that we were going to have disruption. Uh, we have a preventative patrol model that is operating today, very similar to what we've had the last few days. It's a combination of National Guard, uh, local municipalities, primarily Minneapolis and St. Paul, Ramsey and Hennepin County, that are out working the streets today, uh, prepared to rapidly respond if we have disruption or riots. Uh, and also prepare to protect people's First Amendment rights if folks are coming to protest. Uh, and we have been working with community. We continue to work with community, uh, whether it's at the Memorial at 38th in Chicago or at Little Earth or all over the Twin Cities area. Uh, peace officers have been working with community to keep the peace. That's what the community wants, and that's what we want. Um, this afternoon, we will move back into our more multi-agency coordinated uh, presence. Uh, we'll bring more folks in from suburbs and other sheriff's departments, and we'll continue to integrate them with the Minnesota State Patrol, Minnesota De uh, De Department of Natural Resources, and the Minnesota National Guard. Uh, and we will once again go out to patrol uh, to make sure that the curfew is enforced, uh, to make sure that lawful and peaceful demonstrations, their First Amendment rights are protected, and to make sure that um, riotous behavior, arson, uh, violence, robbery, looting, is not allowed to be the story of the day. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to Major General John Jensen of the Minnesota National Guard.